A Different Lens is a documentary series that draws on the unique perspective of academic and industry leaders to uncover insights into the magnitude and complexity of the themes and challenges that will shape our future. Tonight, in our first live in the series, we're addressing the virus that changed the world in a matter of months. Ever since COVID-19 emerged, scientists and researchers have been scrambling to find out as much as they can about it. From the race to develop a vaccine, to investigating effective treatments, just how vital is this research going to be as the world rebuilds? Welcome to A Different Lens Live, coming to you from Monash University's Clayton campus. We hope you find A Different Lens Live to be a rich discussion between a diverse panel of experienced researchers and academics. Their expert opinion and commentary they offer are their own and are being shared in the context of growing thought leadership during this global COVID-19 pandemic. I'm here tonight with our panellists who are all leading members of Monash University's Biomedicine Discovery Institute. Please welcome immunologist and expert in respiratory viruses and head of microbiology, Professor Stephen Turner. Cell biologist and head of the Cancer Targeting and Nuclear Therapeutics Laboratory, Dr Kylie Wagstaff. Immunologist and head of the Dendritic Cells Laboratory, Associate Professor Meredith O'Keefe. And immunologist and molecular biologist and head of the Dendritic Cell Receptor Laboratory, Associate Professor Marie Lahoud. Given this is an incredibly busy time for all of you, we really appreciate your time tonight. So thank you and let's get into it. So Stephen Turner, researchers around the world are doing everything they can to get a better understanding of COVID-19. Why do we need to know as much as possible? Well, really, um, it's about putting ourselves in the best position possible to be able to come up um, with new ways to combat the infection, either through vaccines, which I know that we're going to talk about a bit later, but also through th developing therapeutics, so potential drugs that can be used to help either stop the infection or at least ameliorate the consequences of infection. What do we know about the virus at the moment? Well, in terms of uh, the immune response, uh, the good news is, is that our body's immune system can see the virus and it does mount a response. So that's good news. Um, the sort of what we don't know is how long lived that immunity will last. Um, so a feature of our adaptive immune systems um, is that we set up this protective state. And in many cases, that is long lived for the life of a person or an individual. Um, we, we're not clear whether that is the case here. Um, the other question is, is, you know, we might mount an immune response, but is it the right sort? Is it going to be able to protect us if we're ever exposed to the infection again? Meredith O'Keefe, what do you think is really vital to know about this virus? As Steve says, knowledge is power, and it's to obtain as much knowledge about the virus as we can is, is really important. At the moment, we don't understand why some people don't get sick, why some people do get sick. Is there a difference in, in these people with the cells that the virus gets into? What are, what are the differences? You know, what, what are the, the factors about that virus that really cause disease in, in some people and in others can, can seem to be invisible? And, you know, really there needs to be a lot of work to go into examining how the, the virus gets into cells and what it does once it's in there. We also know that this is hitting people aged over 70 really hard and we know a bit about the fact that it's because they have a compromised immune system. But exactly what do we know and why? Why is it hitting these people so hard? Because I guess, you know, the flu hits young and old. Sure, I'd have to say there we don't know. I mean, we, we do know that, that people over 70 do have a compromised immune system to, compared to a younger adult. But exactly why these people are, are extremely susceptible to this virus is, is not clear. And uh, we, again, we really need more work to understand exactly what isn't happening, if you like, in, in these people. Why are they so affected? Mm. Stephen, how is COVID-19 different from other coronaviruses? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a fantastic question because um, there's already coronaviruses that are in circulation to start with, and these are what we call um, seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, there's four types, but no one really paid them much attention in the past because they actually cause common cold-like symptoms, um, so there's not much to sort of write home about. So not a lot's known about them. 
And of course, this virus is quite different because it causes this severe acute respiratory distress syndrome or SARS syndrome. So in that way, it's actually quite similar to other coronaviruses that have made this jump from sort of animal into humans and uh, early 2000s there was the original SARS outbreak which everyone um, was very worried about and there was a lot of focus on and subsequent to that in uh, around 2010-2012 there was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus which is the same. Um, so it's similar to those but it's quite different because SARS and MERS, um, they, those viruses essentially burnt out after a short time, whereas of course this one has gone global and is now the pandemic. And understanding the factors that are driving that is really what we're trying to do here. Mm. Do you think people initially thought that things would end up like SARS and MERS and, and people are really quite shocked that it, it kept going? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, I mean, I found myself even sort of looking at, you know, what we knew about coronaviruses and the, the fact that this didn't present like as serious as SARS and MERS in terms of um, the initial outbreaks. It seemed much more like a common cold in terms of the symptoms. But it was clear as more people became infected um, and then as a consequence more people needed hospitalisation and care, it just became apparent how serious this virus actually was mm. or is. Kylie Wagstaff, were you surprised by how serious it became? Yeah, I think so. All viruses can shock us with what they do and I think one of the benefits to us about the SARS and the MERS was they burned up fast and hot so they they tended to wipe out people and they were sort of self-regulating in that way whereas this virus has a much slower burn in the population it transmits very easily but it takes a lot longer before people get rapidly sick and I think that is a benefit to the virus but a disadvantage to us. Mm. Meredith how is COVID-19 playing out in the body it seems that some people with even mild cases are taking a long time to recover. Oh, that's true. And I've, I've read cases of, of people who are asymptomatic where viruses can be detected in the, in, in the respiratory tract after 28 days. And, and yet still these people have no um, visible signs of a viral infection. Again, why is that? I mean, viruses are amazingly clever and they have ways of, of inhibiting our immune system. Is that what is happening in those people? And it's, it's really not clear. Um, it's not clear also what is happening in different organs of people who have been sick. In, in kidneys, for example, um, in the heart, there have been reports, you know, exactly how is this virus affecting the long-term health of, of people who are sick? Again, is, is, is still an unknown, actually. What do you make of the asymptomatic nature of this virus? I find it really strange. If, if everybody was asymptomatic, then, then you'd think, OK, this is just a, you know, a simple cold type virus. But the fact that you have a population that is asymptomatic and a population who gets incredibly sick and there doesn't, there's not something obvious besides people who are, who are over 70 that really you know, strat stratifies those two groups, it makes it fascinating. You know, what is the, the uh, chink in the armour, if you like, that, that the virus is found in some people but not in others and, and that we still don't know. Stephen, how dangerous is this asymptomatic nature of the virus? Yeah, it's, it's not so much dangerous necessarily, but I mean, what people who um, don't present with symptoms but still have the virus, um, they don't feel sick. So as a consequence, uh, they will go to work or they will, well, they used to be able to hop on a plane um, and then travel. Um, and this is something that we see with influenza, that actually the virus can grow to a level um, in our lungs and start to transmit from people before symptoms actually um, become evident. And that's the chance, that's the window for the virus to transmit to other people. And it was interesting, I think, that again, in early reports with this virus suggested, or people thought that it was only once people got quite sick that the virus then transmitted. Um, and that's why people, again, weren't too concerned, because it was easy to pick up people who were sick and, and then do the quarantining and everything. Um, but as, you know, more study was done, it was clear that it's estimated that about 40% of infections are likely asymptomatic. So that just provides an extra window of opportunity for the virus, the people who don't feel sick and therefore are sort of interacting with others um, to transmit. That's why the physical distancing and the sort of quarantining has been such an effective public health exercise in limiting transmission of the infection. Mm. So even though official infection rates are quite low in Australia compared to you know, a lot of other places in the world, that perhaps maybe is not the true infection rate, is that? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, I certainly think that we've underestimated the amount of infection because um, that's very dependent on 
identifying those that have been infected. One way to get a better idea of that is to actually um, take samples from people and look at the legacy that the virus leaves behind in terms of the immunity or the immune response that's been generated. Um, so they're starting to do that now in other jurisdictions like the United States and in Europe and the UK. Um, that said, uh, you know, one thing is, is that we're not seeing a lot of cases still popping up. So it is kind of a, it's quite low now. And that would suggest to me that there's actually low levels of infection in the community um, and probably started off from quite a low base to start with. Well, medical scientists across the globe are searching for potential cures for COVID-19. Several human trials are underway, but will an effective vaccine ever be found? The world is looking for a COVID-19 vaccine, and fast. Industries have crumbled, hundreds of thousands have died, and communities are desperate to rekindle a sense of normality. But as global leaders promise a rapid cure, the scientific community has their doubts. In what has become a highly politicised issue, the question of when a vaccine becomes available is not only when, but how. Stephen, Donald Trump has his own ideas on the timing of this, but how mm. far away do you think a vaccine really is? And Donald Trump has a lot of ideas. He, he should keep to himself probably. Um, so I think optimistically people are sort of talking 12 to 18 months and I, th I think that is quite optimistic. Um, you know, I would like to think that perhaps, you know, that's at the sort of um, fast end of this. So we're looking at least 18 months, I'd say. I, I think, you know, there's lots of research going on and my colleagues will sort of speak to that in a minute. Um, but understanding, you know, it's not just about coming up with a vaccine, but then having to make it that takes time and making sure that it's manufactured in enough volume so that you have enough doses, even the little containers that the vaccine goes into, you know, that all needs to be made. So there's lots of things that need to fall into place before something can be basically deployed as useful. So that takes time. Mm -hmm. Meredith, is it possible that we may never find a vaccine? Uh, it's possible. It's out of the 130 or so trials that are currently underway of, of, of new vaccines, we hope that it, at least one of them will be successful, but it's, it is for, for any infection, for any vaccine that's developed, there isn't a, a definite answer that yes, it will work. And the more we understand again about the virus, about exactly how it affects the immune system will help to inform how to make a better vaccine. And, you know, again, hopefully one of those 130 will work, but at the same time, there's more and more work going on all the time to understand more about the virus, to improve vaccines as we, as we move forward. Kylie Wagstaff, is that why treatments and coming up with treatments at the moment is important too, because a vaccine is really, you know, hanging in the balance at the moment? Um, I think with any virus or any vaccine program, va vaccines and treatments always go hand in hand. There's always going to be a portion of the population that can't get a vaccine for whatever reason. It's contraindicated because of other health reasons or it isn't available for them. So having a reliable treatment for those groups of people is always going to be important. And in this case, if we can have a treatment while we're still developing an effective vaccine, then that's going to be important as well. Mm. We'll talk more about treatments shortly, but Marie Le Hood, there are billions of dollars being thrown at trying to find a vaccine. And as we've mentioned, there are about 130 groups working towards this worldwide. Is it therefore inevitable that someone will be successful? We hope so. We absolutely hope so. But the important thing to uh, recognise is that we're all trying different approaches based on our basic knowledge of how the immune system works, how the immune system recognises viruses, the best way of delivering a vaccine. So we try different approaches, knowing that some of them are more, more likely to work for some situations rather than others. Some vaccines might work for the majority of the population, but may not be as good for an older population. Other approaches may take a little longer to develop, but may target that older population and develop better immune responses in them. So it's important to have a variety of approaches so you have different approaches that might work for the diff different members of the population. We don't have one vi vaccine for flu. We have several in circulation. And it's really important to develop multiple approaches so that some will be successful. 
Stephen, what sort of vaccine will we need and will one vaccine work for everyone in every population? It sounds like it, it won't. Yeah, so um, the sort of standard vaccine induces what we call an antibody response. Um, so these are soluble effector molecules that are produced by um, what's called the B cell, which is a part of our immune system. And those proteins, um, the antibodies, what they do is they basically attach to the outside of a virus and they prevent its attachment and infection. So that's a standard way. Um, and that's many of the vaccines that are currently um, either being developed or in clinical trial now. There's a few of those are design, they de they're designed to induce that sort of immunity. Um, that said, um, you know, there's other arms of the immune response that we need to also consider. Um, so there's other white blood cells called T cells. Um, so these are a bit different. They work by actually targeting the cells infected with the virus. So they can identify the cells and kill them off basically and hence limit how much virus there is. So a vaccine that's able to sort of uh, basically encompass both arms of that adaptive immune response is going to be sort of one of the most effective. And there's clear examples of that. So the smallpox vaccine was able to do that. And of course we were able to eradicate smallpox from the globe. In terms of being able to work in everyone, um, the answer is no, it's not sort of a one size fits all. Um, there's various um, responses that people will make and Meredith alluded to this, we just don't know why some people make a necessarily a good response and some don't. Um, but even sort of vaccines in different geographical locations, you know, um, how people respond to vaccines is going to be quite different whether you're old or whether you're young. So what would be ideal is having a few different things we could choose from that we might find work better in one population versus another and then be able to deploy them simultaneously. Is there anything we can learn from the Ebola vaccine? Yeah, so that, that really comes back to this question, well, how quickly can we get a vaccine for something like SARS-CoV-2, um, COVID-19? Um, and really the usual time frame is, you know, around 10 to 15 years from conception right through to being able to make it and give it to people. And that's because there's lots of regulatory elements that need to be complied with in terms of not just um, whether it works, but whether it's going to be safe. So making sure that the vo there's no adverse reactions or events because you're giving the vaccine. But sometimes the public need um, outweighs that sort of consideration. So it's a risk assessment that's made. And that was made in the case of the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa, where um, the National Institutes of Health in the United States fast-tracked a vaccine that was in development. Um, they did a safety trial to make sure that it, was, it should have been safe, and then they put it straight into the field. And in that case, it was very effective. So it actually helped stop the outbreak of Ebola at that time. So there's precedent for being able to face fast-track vaccines. Um, and this might be one of those cases. Mm. What are some of the risks, though, of fast-tracking a vaccine? Well, really, it's twofold. One is making sure it works. So this comes back to this question that we started with. We don't know whether the immunity in juice is actually going to be effective, and we need research into that now. Um, the other, of course, is um, you know there's lots of different flavours of vaccine. You know, people working on different strategies making sure that they're safe when you put them into people is paramount. So it should be said that, you know, that's the key consideration even when you're fast tracking. So really the step that's um, jumped over is the sort of broader testing in multiple jurisdictions. So once it sort of meets safety and efficacy, then you can sort of use it straight away. Um, so they're the sort of, that's the danger that, you know, it doesn't work as effectively as we think it might or there's potentially adverse events that can be associated with it. Mireille Lahoud, is safety really the key factor here? Absolutely. Safety has to come first. And we need to be informed about safety in understanding how the vaccine works, but also understanding how the immune system works to develop a vaccine that is going to be safe. So that needs rigorous and methodical research to ensure that you tackle those arms appropriately. You and your team are working on a vaccine. Can you tell us about your approach? Well, we're immunologists and our focus is understanding how the immune system works. So our approach to developing a vaccine is to deliver the vaccines directly to the sentinels of the immune system. These are the cells that normally take up signs of danger or infection, process them and tell 
other arms of the immune system to mount an immune response. So rather than having a Facebook post or a Twitter post, we send an email targeted to those sentinels and say, here's the danger, process it, and then initiate an immune response. In doing so, it allows us to use much smaller amounts. Hopefully we can do it with less doses, but we can also tailor it to the part of the um, virus or the protein of the virus that we know will initiate the best immune response and cause protection. The other thing is this is more likely to work in an older population. So again, back to the not one size fits all, you need to try different approaches for vaccines and pick the ones that work best for different populations. If it's going to work, you hope it's going to work really well in the older population, will it still work well in younger populations? Absolutely. What are the next steps in your research and how close maybe are you to human trials? Next steps is develop, uh, we're developing the first generation of vaccines, understanding that they are safe, understanding that they induce a potent immune response and understanding that they can protect against disease. That's what comes first. Once we go through those, then we can look at next steps for human trials. Mm -hmm. That's at least... 12 to 18 months away. Yeah, that's great. I guess in Australia too, we don't have to rush as much as perhaps the rest of the world does. Is that the feeling you get? And Kylie, do you feel, we'll talk about your treatments shortly too, but is there not as much of a rush? I mean, I think it's a global pandemic, so we have to think globally. So we, we don't want to take our feet off the accelerator for sure, but we definitely don't have any reason to discount things like safety or, or rigorous science. We, we have to keep making sure that we do that at every stage, especially because the levels in our community are low. Mm. Stephen, if a vaccine is found, who should receive it first? Oh, that's a $6 million question, isn't it? Because, um, you know, it sort of depends who, I mean, who you talk to. Um, you know, an interesting discussion around influenza pandemics is exactly around that. So who should get the therapies or the vaccine? And it might surprise some people that, you know, the economists, for example, would argue that it should be people that fly planes or uh, the stevedores on ports um, because basically you don't want the economies to shut down. Um, in this case, it's a little different because everyone's self-quarantined, so the economy's shut down anyway for different reasons. Um, you know, so in that case, you know, there'd be an argument certainly for those that are most at risk. Um, so frontline healthcare workers would be primarily probably a first group off, cab off the rank in that sense. Um, and then hopefully then the more at risk, so the elderly that we've sort of discussed um, that seem to have um, a higher rate of um, the actual pathology associated with the infection. Um, and then we can start thinking about other people. Mm. Meredith, there have been concerns raised about what's been called vaccine <coughs> nationalism, <coughs> with one country looking after itself first, but how important is global distribution? I think it's absolutely essential. I think, I think all of us as scientists, you don't really, I mean, I'm, I'm nationalistic with Olympics, for example, but, but not with science. Science is a, is a, is a global uh, field, you know, where, where scientists first, I think everybody really who's working on vaccines, who's working on trying to understand SARS, is really working to, for knowledge rather than for a particular country or for a particular vaccine even. It's, it's really to understand and to improve health mm. across the world, you know. It's yeah, yeah. Well, as work continues on finding a vaccine, restrictions are starting to be lifted, but it would be, we're being too cautious or are not cautious enough. And what can we learn from other countries? As Australia begins to ease restrictions, people are going back to work and the economy is starting up again. But is it premature? South Korea flattened its curve with early testing and social distancing, but a lifting of restrictions saw a spike in coronavirus cases. Some even tested positive for the second time, which leads scientists to hypothesize that the disease can hibernate in the body, ready to reinfect in the future. So when it comes to returning to normal life, it begs the question, how soon is too soon? Stephen, what can we learn from the rest of the world when it comes to lifting restrictions? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so Australia's in this very unique position, I think, um, 
in that we're one of the leading countries that have been able to really effectively control the spread um, of this virus. So on one hand, you might argue that actually other jurisdictions could learn from us. It's this double-edged sword though, I think. <clears throat> because we've been able to control the infection so effectively, it actually means that in terms of level of Im immunity that's out in the community, um, there's still quite a lot of people that would otherwise still be susceptible if we um, release the restrictions too early. And that includes um, you know, allowing people to sort of fly into the country from other, com from other places. Um, in terms of what we can learn, I think we can look to places like South Korea, Germany, um, and some of the Scandinavian countries, not Sweden as it turns out, um, where they've been able to manage um, the release of people out of these kind of very restrictive conditions now, um, at, the ma at the same time as being able to jump on top of any outbreak that occurs. And I think that's the unique position that Australia's in, that we're now very well prepared that with an easing of restrictions, if there is another outbreak, uh, and here we're sort of not talking a huge spread, just a little kind of cluster, um, we're now well positioned to be able to jump on top of that very quickly and shut it down before it spreads too broadly. Kylie, what do you think about the pace at which Australia's lifting restrictions? I think it's, it's good that we're starting to lift restrictions and I think it's good that we're being cautious about it. I think we should all be really proud of the way we've managed to flatten the curve and prevent, prevent infections from growing. And I would hate to see that work undone if we go too quickly. So I think we do need to keep being a little bit patient and a little bit cautious and be prepared that if something goes wrong, we would have to go back again. Meredith, what's your view? I think it's really tricky. Um, I, I do believe that, that we need to be cautious, particularly for the elderly, for example, and the immunocompromised. But I also see that there's a big workforce out there that, that needs to be earning money. And... We, we need to get people working again. And it, and yes, it's, it's happening now, which is great. And I, and, and I do think, you know, as, we, as slowly people go back to work, hopefully we don't get other major outbreaks, but I think it has to happen. And it's, you know, as it is a little bit scary, I think, for people as they go back, as, as people start to go back to school. But um, again, I think that, that balance of science versus economy is a really hard one to, to, to do, a really hard one to balance. and. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm not making those decisions, actually. <laughs> mm -hmm. Marae, it's difficult, isn't it? How much do you have to think about economics in your role? Can you purely disregard them? Is it something that you have to think about? I don't think any of us can disregard them because we're parts of a family, we're members of a community, and we're seeing what's happening to everyone around us. But I am in favour of a cautious approach, but we've also all learnt new skill sets, mm. including the distancing, including the much higher levels of hygiene and sanitation that we've had to ever experience before. So with appropriate precautions, I think we can carefully ease restrictions as long as we're making sensible choices. Stephen, are you concerned at all about a second and, say, third wave? Look, I think if you look back at other pandemics um, and try to learn lessons from that, um, there's always been second waves. And, you know, the classic that I wheel out to my students is discussion around the 1918 Spanish flu. And there's actually, you can draw a lot of similarities between studying the behaviour there and this current virus. Um, so, for example, there's a famous story in San Francisco where they put in restrictions just like we've had in today um, in current times and then they lifted them and they had a subsequent wave um, that actually was more potent more virulent and caused um, a lot more damage I think we have to be concerned about that so but sort of taking Murray's point there which I think is a fantastic one I think you know it has sort of fundamentally changed how people think about these things now I sort of found it amazing at the start that people found hygiene a bit of a novelty you know, so the fact that people have taken some responsibility on themselves to make sure that they can not only look after themselves but others, I, I think that we, I fully expect that we'll see outbreaks, continued outbreaks, because we haven't fully controlled the infection. There's still sort of hints of it out there. Um, but as a consequence of everyone's actions and being responsible um, and taking responsibility themselves, I think that we'll, um, we'll be able to control it in a much better way. So. I'm hopeful that we won't actually see a second wave, at least here um, in Australia.
Meredith, I saw you nodding a lot there. Is personal responsibility really the key? Oh, I think it's really the key, yeah. It, it is. It's, um, you know, keeping the social distancing. It's what, the, the thing that does worry me, even, even personally, is, is how we, are we going to work public transport? How are we going to work buses and, and trams and trains? And, um, and that, I think, is, is going to be a difficult one going forward. And again, you know, it's not a, on a, anyone that's been on a peak hour train or tram. It's, it's impossible to stay one and a half metres away from each other at all to, to wash your hands in between. So, um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting to watch going forward how people will manage that. Will most people change their working hours? Will they work from home? Will they, you know, work, work outside of, of peak hours? But, uh, but I think people can do it. I mean, I think people are taking much more responsibility. And I think workplaces too are being flexible in that sense too, in the, including here, which, which is great to allow, allow people that flexibility. Do you think it's possible to predict how long the testing and tracing regime will have to go on for? That's open to all of you. Oh, maybe else. Yeah, so I think um, in terms of that, it really is until we have uh, effective vaccines. Um, we need to be able to um, put in place um, a level of immunity in the, com in the population that means that the transmission of the virus will be almost negligible. Um, you know, and we can, of course, with the development of therapeutics, help treatment of the infection, but it won't prevent it. Um, so really, in some sense, I think there is, you know, and I've seen some really nice modelling that's come out of the UK where they've sort of tried to predict this. Um, and they're saying sort of up to two years. Um, but the key here is, I think, again, coming back to this point that I think Australia is very well placed as, as a country to deal with any outbreaks. So really, Kylie mentioned this, this flattening of the curve. What that really means is having, um, controlling the infection such that if you do get sick, you will have every opportunity to get the care you will need if you have to go to hospital. And that was always a concern with something like this when it first landed, mm. um, that our health system would be overwhelmed. And now that that's under control and we're sort of, even with this kind of sporadic outbreaks, we can be much more confident, I think, that we can deal with it going forward. Mm. Kylie, as we've been saying, the aim of easing restrictions is to return to some kind of normality. What that is, we're not quite sure yet. And in lieu of finding a vaccine, we have been talking about the fact that we you know, hopefully can come up with some effective treatments. Is it likely that we can find some decent treatments? Absolutely. I, I think that it would be very difficult to not be able to design a drug to work against an infectious disease molecule. But it takes time and it takes money and, and those are the things we maybe don't have. So, yeah, we definitely can do it. We just need time. Mm. You and your team have discovered that an antiparasitic called ivermectin may be able to kill COVID-19 in people. Um, you've tested this on primate cells in the lab. Can you talk us through what happened? Sure. So we worked on ivermectin for about 10 years. We've looked at its antiviral properties against a whole range of viruses. Um, and because it works on a pathway that we have innately inside ourselves that a lot of viruses try to target, we thought that it would also work on this virus. And we found that it does exactly that. In cells growing in a dish in the laboratory, we're able to stop the virus from replicating within about 24 to 48 hours. And it does that really effectively. So now we just need to be able to see whether we can translate that into a living, breathing human being. Mm, yeah, that sounds incredibly promising at the moment. How far off do you think you are for human trials? Uh, we're getting closer every day. So <laughs> we're doing um, really important preclinical work around the dosing. So ivermectin is a drug that's been around for about 30 years. Uh, my lab in particular likes to do what we call drug repurposing. So we look at drugs that already exist in the world for one condition or another, and even drugs that have never made it to market but exist, and see whether we can find another activity that they have and repurpose them for a new condition. And that can speed up the development process. But in doing that, you get benefits from all the knowledge we know about the drug. We know how it's safe, we know how to make it, we know how to transport it, we know how to administer it. But what we need to find is whether all of that knowledge if those safe regimes that we have can also work on this particular indication and, and that's what we're working towards now. Mm. And, and as you mentioned, it's really getting the dosage right. Correct. Yeah, so it's making sure that the dose that you need to cure the virus is the dose that is also safe in people, safety being always key. Mm. Considering ivermectin is an approved drug, what's your advice to people who are thinking about 
you know, popping a pill of ivermectin to, to try and ward off COVID-19 or to try and get better, to, to recover from COVID-19. So my advice there is the same as my advice with all medications. You shouldn't take any medication that hasn't been prescribed to you by your personal physician. And in the case of ivermectin for COVID-19, we just have to go back to until we have a randomised controlled trial that says that it works, it doesn't work. So until we get to that point, we aren't at that point. Mm. Overnight, the World Health Organisation suspended a clinical trial of the anti-malaria drug hydroxychloroquine, which has, I guess, been made famous by Donald Trump as well. Um, he claims he was taking it as a preventative measure. But does this really highlight how careful we have to be when we're trying to just treat ourselves and, and you know, use different drugs as preventative measures and take it into our own hands? Um, yeah, as I said, we shouldn't take <laughs> any medication into our own hands, but I think especially in the case of a brand new virus where even as a scientific and medical community, there's so many gaps in our knowledge about how it works. It, it's really naive to think that, oh, I found this drug and everyone should take it without understanding first how that drug interacts with the virus in the context of your body. So yeah, caution always needed. Mm. What have you found, Stephen, about um, this drug? It's been bandied around a lot. What, what are the side effects that you know of so far? Um, well, yeah. So a recent study just came out showing that actually hydroxychloroquine um, in combination with some antibiotics actually could lead to adverse events, um, particularly uh, cardiac events. Um, and I think, you know, what is kind of amazing is if you sort of look in the databases and look at the amount of work that's been going on is, you know, there's a lot, a lot of clinical trials that are going on in, on the use of hydroxychloroquine. Um, but really the data coming out really does point to the fact that it's not effective at controlling infection. Now that said, it's all been in the context of therapeutics. So that is, once you're infected, then they prescribe it. Um, what is a little less unknown, I think, is how it works potentially as a preventative measure. So hydroxychloroquine is actually used for mal um, preventing malarial infection. So you take tablets before you travel to a place that is endemic for malaria. So look, you know, I mean, maybe there's a potential that it could be sort of used in that context. Um, and there's actually a clinical trial happening here in Australia, in Melbourne, through the Walter and Liza Hall Institute that is asking that exact question. Um, so the jury's still out, we'll have to wait and see what that says. But yeah, I fully concur with uh, um, Kylie's comments that don't take anything unless it's prescribed. Yeah. Don't take anything that wasn't meant for humans. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Now, will there be another pandemic like this? And if so, will we be ready for it, Stephen? Oh, look, that's a question I get a lot. And I, you know, I think my answer is yes. Um, we only have to look in the last 20 years. Um, you know, SARS, MERS, even though they weren't pandemics, they were really representative of what was to come. Um, MERS, in fact, is still bubbling along. Um, so even though it sort of broke out, it's not necessarily a pandemic, but it's causing problems in the Middle East. 2009, we had an influenza pandemic, so only 10 years ago. Um, so I look, I think in that context, I think it's inevitable. As the population of the globe grows, as we encroach more on ecosystems, um, where these viruses, or at least the predecessors of these viruses, are in circulation, um, it's very likely that we'll have another event like this. And, you know, there's hints of that, even things like Hendra virus and Nipah virus, you know, so we've had experience with those here in Australia. Um, there's always a chance that these things can jump from one species into humans and then, as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2, then take off. Mm. Meredith, given this pandemic did really take us by surprise, will we be ready for the next one and what do we need to do to be ready for the next one? I'd like to be able to say yes, but I'm not sure. I mean, I think the the big problem that we have, even at the moment, is that there's research funding is really tight and you have projects that you work on and you have a certain amount of budget to, to work on those projects. And there's really nothing left in the kitty to suddenly start working on, on a new project. And that's and that's the thing that's really difficult. We don't have a, a, a major um, you know, laboratory or institute that's dedicated to be pandemic ready, if you like, that's, that's working on different parts of, of different viruses specifically with that view in mind. And, and I think it is really difficult when you're working, um, you know, on a low base from a funding level to then 
really expect that we have a full-blown research effort to a brand new pandemic. Um, it's, it's really tricky. I, I, and again, yeah, I'd love to say yes, we, we would, but I'm, I'm just not sure in, in, in the current you know, environment of, of funding. Mm. Kylie, how do you think you guys can get it across that you know, funding for medical research is so vital? I think this, if this pandemic shows anything, it shows that. So we've had SARS-1, this is SARS-2. I suspect there'll be a SARS-3. And the question is whether the, we have the readiness to prepare for that will be on whether we had funding in between now and then. So we need funding now, but we need it to continue at a steady state into the future so that we can develop stuff. Mm. Murray, do you think there's been enough of a focus on funding during this whole pandemic? We hear about, we've got to get a vaccine, we've got to get a vaccine, we need treatments. But do we hear enough about we need funding? No, I think each of us has been doing the best we can and applying for funding where we can from the sources that are available with the times that are available. About four and a half months ago, we didn't know anything about SARS-CoV-2. And every one of us has worked on their own piece of a jigsaw puzzle to try to build a big picture of how this virus works and what's happening, and there are still lots of gaps and we need to fill those gaps. But to fill those gaps, to do that work, we need the funding to support it, to support the researchers working on it. But also what we learn out of this, we will apply to other viruses, to other infections, to cancer therapy. So the knowledge that we build, that discovery knowledge is absolutely critical because then it underpins what comes next. Mm, you all seem to agree. <laughs> With that a lot. Is, is it important not just thinking about a pandemic like this and this virus, but yeah, as you say, for cancer and kind of things? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, I think Marais again touched, hit the head on the nail there. In terms of the fundamental biomedical research that's done, you know, you're trying to work out how stuff works at a very fundamental level. Um, you know, and that's part of the fun of being a research scientist, I find, is, you know, you sort of wake up and you're discovering things for the first time. Now, you know, my, my area is in influenza, um, a respiratory infection, but the sorts of things that we do to study the immune system could be easily applied to something like SARS-CoV-2. And as a consequence, you just never know where, you know, the, those sort of leads are going to take you. Um, you know, I think one of the impressive things, I think, you know, I've been at Monash now for only four years, working in the Biomedical Discovery Institute is, you know, the, the critical mass of fantastic brains, um, you know, highly skilled researchers, particularly in the area of infectious disease and immunity, where we've been able to apply, even though we work in quite distinct areas, we've been able to apply our knowledge um, and our res resources um, to some extent to this problem. And that's the key, you know. So being able to resource that in a way that we are ready is you know, f very important if we're going to deal with this in the f any sort of likelihood of this in the future. Mm. The hit to universities because of COVID-19 has been huge. Do you think that the medical research sector is at risk of losing some great minds? And, and what are we going to do when there are similar outbreaks in the future? Yeah, look, uh, it's a really important question because um, the biomedical research sector has been under pressure for some time. Um, you know, in real terms, the funding for biomedical research has drifted from around sort of two and a half percent of GDP now down less than sort of one and a half percent. Um, we have things like the Medical Research Future Fund, which is a fantastic investment, but, you know, the cost of research has gone up. You know, um, we have a fantastic workforce that's been invested in, and we are at real risk of losing um, that capacity and capabilities. And it's one of those weird nuances of the Australian system where, you know, universities are very reliant on students to help cross-subsidise the sort of research activity that we're talking about, and research excellence, really, um, where, you know, a lot of us um, work in areas where we're internationally renowned for the stuff we do. So the COVID-19 impact has been hugely significant for universities, um, but in terms of their bottom line. Um, and the problem is, is that, you know, a lot of the research that goes on are research only. They're not research teaching academics. They don't have a job that they can fall back onto. And that's why, you know, institutions like Monash and other um, universities in Australia, they're, they're so important because they help support that research excellence 
through that mechanism, and that's at a real, that's at real risk at the moment. So yeah, I'm I'm worried um, about the future in that context. Hmm. Do, does anyone else have any comments they'd like to make about that? I'd support that completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah. certainly, I think I think the um, the worrying thing at the moment too, in the within um, or amongst researchers, is that there is this fear of, of, you know, where am I going to be next year? You know, will I have a job? And that is, it's actually really sad to see when you see really highly skilled people who are, you know, really amongst the top of their game in the, you know, internationally, that, that there really isn't funding for them. And that's, well, that's the harsh reality. Well, that's all we have time for tonight, unfortunately, but we'll be sure to keep a close eye on developments. Thank you so much to Stephen, Kylie, Meredith and Marae. Your input has been invaluable and thank you so much for your expertise, especially during such a busy time. For more discussions in the A Different Lens series, head to lens.monash.edu and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us.